Every product and service has an impact on the world around us. With the Life Cycle Assessment, or short LCA, we measure this environmental impact. In this video, I will walk you through the fundamentals of a life cycle assessment, who it is useful for, and how the process of conducting an LCA looks like in practice. So let's go! You've probably asked yourself that question many times. Which tomatoes are better for the environment? The ones from Spain or from the Netherlands? Should I buy the organic t-shirt or the regular one? Or if you think even bigger, what is the impact of the supermarket I'm walking through right now? But answering this question can be very difficult. There are just so many factors to consider, like which raw materials were involved in the production process. How are these products produced? What about heating, water, ventilation? How do they get transported by truck, rail or airplane? And because this can become very confusing very fast, life cycle assessment is a standardized framework that governs how we are supposed to measure these footprints. But here's a disclaimer. Standardized does not mean that you can just compare one LCA to any other. And that takes us right to the first part of our life cycle assessment, defining the goal and scope. A life cycle assessment is quite an extensive analysis, so you wouldn't just conduct one for fun. Uh, we have to make choices every day about uh, uh, a business, about uh, money, about investments, but uh, at the same time about uh, um, the environment. And for that, uh, we had to take into account uh, really the measurement of our impact. You always have a goal in mind. That also means you have to understand why you're conducting an LCA in the first place. There are usually three different reasons why a company would want to conduct a life cycle assessment. The first would be to comply with regulations. In many countries and industries, you need to show your environmental footprint in order to sell your products. So your environmental footprint becomes some sort of license to operate. Customer demand is another reason to conduct an LCA. Especially businesses often want to know more about the environmental performance of the materials and products they purchase. It impacts their own footprint. The third big reason is purpose. Many leaders rightly see it as their responsibility to lead by example. Happy Cocoa is a purpose-driven brand with a mission to deliver vegan dairy replacements in the European market. And the first step to improve is, of course, to measure. By the way, if, if you want to measure your environmental footprint, check out our website ecochain.com. So now we know who we are conducting the assessment for, but before we start crunching numbers, we need to look at what we will actually analyze. First, we define what we will be assessing. Will we analyze a product or a material or an entire company? How much will we need to analyze? We want to define the functional unit, for example, one kilogram of tomatoes. Then we need to define the system we are analyzing, so the impact category we want to measure in. This could mean we want to focus on, for example, CO2 emissions. If we would want to conduct a life cycle assessment with the goal of generating an environmental product declaration, we would build our goal and scope around the methods that are required by the regulatory bodies. This is why an LCA does not necessarily need to be comparable with another one. If you compare two assessments with a different goal in mind, they might not be compatible to each other. There are a number of frameworks to overcome that problem. The product category rules, short PCR, do exactly that. They standardize the creation of an EPD in a product category so that they can later be comparable. Take for instance a construction material such as asphalt. If you follow the product category rule for this category, you will be able to compare two asphalt products to one another. We also need to define which part of the product lifecycle we base our assessment on. The product lifecycle contains the raw material extraction, the processing of the raw materials, the transportation, the use phase and the waste phase. There are a number of concepts that describe parts of the product lifecycle, cradle to gate, cradle to cradle, well to wheel, but they basically all refer back to the original five phases. The product might have a high impact when it goes to waste, or it might be easily recyclable, which makes a big difference for the environmental footprint across the entire life cycle. Last but not least, we also define what we do not want to assess in the LCA. This is extremely important because our analysis can, in theory, never be fully finished. We can always dig deeper, so it's important to define a clear scope for our LCA. Here's an example. The goal of our assessment is to make a t-shirt more sustainable by reducing its emissions during the entire life cycle. We will look at the t-shirt as a whole 
and analyze the environmental impact from cradle to grave. We will look at the CO2 emissions caused by one t-shirt. The next stage in our life cycle assessment is the life cycle inventory. In this phase, we look at the environmental inputs and outputs of a product or service. We are now collecting the data we need for our analysis. Think of it as a bucket. In phase one, we define the buckets we want to put our data in. Now in phase two, we fill these buckets. The goal is to quantify the environmental inputs and outputs of the product or service we are assessing. That could be raw materials, energy, water, or even emissions to air, land, or water. The more complex our processes, the more complex this analysis can be. This is why this phase usually takes the largest amount of time in the assessment. Usually this data gets collected with a data collection sheet or another form of template or spreadsheet. A lot of the data is already available when we look at our energy bills. But often we might need to use lifecycle inventory databases such as EcoInvent. These databases give us the best indication of what the impact of a given material might be. If we need to know the impact of a specific cotton plant from South America, for example, we can often rely on the research of other practitioners and use that data for our analysis. If there is absolutely no data available, we might need to rely on industry averages. Depending on how transparent your supply chains are, you can imagine you might need quite some detective work to get all your environmental data. At the end of phase two, you will end up with a lifecycle inventory flow model, a flow chart that shows all your inputs and outputs, neatly organized. That means you are ready for phase three of our assessment, the lifecycle impact assessment. After collecting all our data, we now have a number of different pieces of information. But in our example, we wanted to analyze the CO2 footprint of a t-shirt. So how can we get to that information? The answer is called impact categories. So we take all our indicators, say nitrous oxide, methane and others, and translate them to our impact category of choice. In our case, that would be global warming potential, which is measured in CO2. Another analysis might be ecotoxicity or acidification. Then we translate these equivalents into an impact category total. So for instance, CO2 equivalent or environmental costs. This of course depends on the goal and scope of our assessment. So let's recap. We started by defining the goal and scope of our analysis. Then we collected all the data we needed in an input output flow model. And then we unify that data in one or more impact categories. Now we have our numbers and what do we do with that? That's right, we still need to interpret the data. And that is phase four of our life cycle assessment. ISO 14044, which is the norm that defines LCA, describes what we need to do in the interpretation. We basically need to conduct a sanity check on our assessment. This is also called a sensitivity assessment. An LCA is a complex analysis and we need to clearly define where our analysis has limitations and how consistent and sensitively it was conducted. If the assessment was conducted for an official purpose, external verifiers might also need to validate our work. Based on that, we can now draw conclusions and recommendations from our assessment. This could mean that we assess how high the emissions for our product or service are, how it compares to other products, and what the biggest levers are to reduce the impact of our product. In the example of one of our clients, we actually found that the biggest impact of their fashion products occurred in the use phase. So educating their customers about using less energy and water when washing their clothes made by far the biggest overall impact. At EcoChain, we help companies measure and improve their environmental footprint. Learn more about EcoChain at ecochain.com and subscribe to our weekly environmental update on our website. Thank you for watching our beginner's guide to life cycle assessment. I really hope that this was a valuable video for you and please write your questions in the comments below or check out our website.